Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of The Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And we are very honored to be uh, joined by a very distinguished guest, uh, Professor Michael Hudson, uh, who's an emeritus professor at the University of Kansas City, Missouri. He's, of course, a very eminent uh, political economist. Uh, the gagglers really need no introduction to his um, innumerable works and writings and uh, interviews and ideas. So we're really very much looking forward to uh, having a very uh, stimulating discussion. I'll just kick it off with a, a few words. Um, I think you have spoken really right almost from the beginning of the uh, launching of the special military operation that there was some tectonic uh, shift uh, in global power that is uh, taking place at the moment. We have um, uh, the West, you know, the Europe, the United States, uh, and you know, various uh, bodies, you know, such as Japan and so on. And then we have uh, kind of Eurasia. And there seems to be a serious major parting of the ways. There's kind of you know, real diff two different worlds that are now being uh, formed. Um, and I just wonder whether, you know, is this process now um, irreversible? I mean, are we now moving towards really a very, uh, you know, multipolar, bipolar what a, a world order? Is that how you see things? Well, the intention of President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken is to make it irreversible. Uh, mm -hmm. Both of them have announced uh, to Americans that the war in Ukraine is simply the first step and a process that's going to take at least 20 years. That's the uh, time frame they've used. And uh, they expect that it will take 20 years to uh, try to resist the world breaking into uh, different part, two parts. It'll take 20 years for the United States to recreate the unipolar uh, dollar-centered economic order that uh, it was able to impose uh, since 1945. Uh, and when they say it's going to take 20 years, they expect uh, President Putin to uh, end uh, President Xi and uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India uh, and the Iranian Prime Minister. All these groups are uh, realizing that uh, if they, they're going to be sanctions against Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, that uh, if they are going to create a multipolar world order, and de-dollarize uh, is necessary, not simply to change the currency and tr trade in their own currency. You need a whole new set of international institutions uh, to replace the unipolar American institutions. You need a BRICS bank to replace uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. You need a trading organization uh, to uh, coordinate uh, fair trade. Uh, and uh, mutual uh, credit to finance the trade uh, that does not use a dollar and does not uh, have American rules that prevent uh, cases from uh, complaints against America from being uh, brought uh, into, uh, into the courts. So you need a new international court system and you almost need a new United Nations uh, because that's been pretty much paralyzed uh, by uh, the American veto. And, uh, to give you an example of how serious this is, uh, you, as you probably know, I'm in quite a bit of danger right now. Uh, the uh, public service uh, announcements on television have been telling me what to do in the case of an atomic war. Uh, yeah. Bomb falls, that I should uh, uh, go to the basement and stay away from the windows, try to stay in the center of the building. And if I'm outside, make sure I take a shower to uh, wash off any of the radioactive uh, dust uh, that's been uh, telling people, and it, that tells me that uh, uh, something is going to make Mr. Putin very, very mad, and we don't know what he's going to do. And uh, we, uh, all the Americans, as you know, have been told to leave, uh, leave uh, Ukraine uh, very quickly, as quickly as they can. So we're, it, uh, it sounds to me like the United States is going to keep upping the ante and upping the ante, uh, at least to hold uh, the NATO countries in Western Europe into the US orbit and uh, make sure that uh, they follow the sanctions. And of course, what this is going to do is uh, create a crisis throughout uh, the global South, Latin America, South Asia, uh, Africa, 
uh, as oil prices go up, uh, food prices go up, and the dollar is soaring against all the European currencies. And when the dollar goes up, that uh, raises the price of raw materials uh, and imports to uh, uh, other countries. And uh, there, you're having uh, a real economic crisis. Mm. What puzzles me, all, all of us who studied uh, military tactics ever since, uh, uh, for me, it's 60 years ago, uh, believed what a clause of it said that a war is a continuation of economic policy. But it seems to me that today we have economic policy being a continuation uh, of uh, uh, war, war, uh, the war that the neoconservatives, the neocons uh, wanted to wage and the whole world uh, e economics are having to adjust to this uh, desire to go to war. Well, I mean, you, 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 you focus on two major pillars here in, in your first answer to George. Um, the 20 year long march, let's put it that way, to um, uh, not only maintain, but to extend American hegemony. And then we have this, and there's a whole literature on it, the world beyond the West, uh, these, all these institutions in the East and the global South. So Michael, the, there's only one question here, which one prevails? The question is, can they exist? You would think normally they could coexist. Uh, and yeah, that, that's, that, see, that's the crux of it. Normally, it should, but we know it because there's an ideological dimension here, okay? And it, it is that the, there's this sense of hubris, of destiny, it's messianic. See, everything else, if it's just geopolitical, coexistence would be obviously be the answer. But that, the problem is, is we have, I'll say it, American exceptionalism. Go ahead. Well, it's also very bad tempered. And the, uh, the, <laughs> the uh, if America feels that it's not able to uh, reimpose its dominance on other countries, uh, it will up the, uh, up the ante and uh, uh, use atomic warfare. And I think when uh, the uh, US military and uh, politicians begin talking about atomic war, they're projecting. They're accusing other countries of doing what they're thinking of doing themselves. That's what worries us all. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, but again, it, it goes back to um, uh, what, what uh, Peter is saying. Now, the Russians, the Chinese are clearly, you know, they, they made a decision, particularly the Russians, that essentially they've, um, they've separated from the West. I mean, this is, and it's a major reversal because after all, Putin uh, originally had a very different plan. He, you know, it was never, you know, the United States, but he, he envisaged uh, Russian-German partnership, Russian-European partnership, tried to maybe separate the Europeans from the Americans, German industrial know-how, Russian natural resources, and that this would be this giant, um, you know, Eurasian power. He's reversed, that's gone, that whole plan's gone. And so now it's, uh, you got Russia, China, India, now Iran is seems to be moving into this um, orbit. Um, you know, will this prevail? Or will the American uh, uh, agenda prevail? And is war inevitable? I mean, what happens when you have these two power blocks, is war inevitable? If I could just interject real quick to follow up with what George is saying before we answer, is that um, the big question is right now is will Nord Stream 1 be turned off? Okay, just to add uh, an extra layer to what George said, because Putin wanted a very strong Russian-German relationship. Now, I'm speaking for myself, obviously, now it's punishment time for not having that. Go ahead. Well, here's the problem that Russian diplomacy has had uh, for a century. Uh, it, uh, it, you be Russians believe that other countries are going to act in their own self-interest. Uh, and uh, Stalin believed that uh, Hitler would not attack uh, Russia because that would be suicide and Hitler would, would lose and uh, it would be a disaster for Germany. But Hitler attacked. Uh, I think that uh, uh, President Putin and other Russians uh, in the 1990s thought that, okay, we're the Cold War is over, we're, uh, we're going to have peace, and the logic of the situation was that uh, uh, West uh, Europe uh, would find an opportunity in finally developing the Russian market and investing in the Russian market and creating enough prosperity so that there could be mutual trade and investment. It was logical to expect that because you thought countries will act in their own self-interest. But uh, the Americans didn't want that because 
the, uh, the more that Europe would turn towards Russia, the more there would be a mutual interest, the less control America would have over the, uh, the one area that it is neo-colonized. It, what, it, what it calls globalization is neo-colonialism, you can think of, and it would be losing its control uh, over Europe. And so you can look at American foreign policy as a Greek tragedy where it brings about exactly the opposite of what it is uh, intended uh, to bring about. So America thought, okay, we're going to, uh, we want uh, Europe to find its mutual trade and investment with us, the United States, not with, uh, not with Russia. And uh, amazingly, uh, Europe did not put its uh, economic interests first, contra close of its. Uh, it, uh, uh, it followed uh, the political uh, background of the United States. And of course, it wasn't really Europe that did this. It was NATO that has the, uh, the tool by which America controls uh, European politics. Uh, so European politics is basically NATO politics. And uh, the obviously uh, German and French and uh, Italian companies, banks, consumers, all would like a peaceful relationship where uh, uh, energy was low priced and they're all making profits, uh, mutual gains with uh, trade with Russia, but uh, that's uh, not happening at all. So an economic explanation would not uh, uh, explain what's happening now. But, you know, but what I find very puzzling is I agree absolutely with both you and George and George, and I've talked about this at great length. Um, it seems like a hollow victory though, because if you have a Germany that is, it, its productivity plummets. I mean, in, you know, in a nutshell, I mean, in the 20th century, German history is pretty turbulent and you know, a lot of people have a lot to say about it. But since the second world war, it's calling card on the world is saying, but we're rich, we are powerful. We are the powerhouse of Europe. And that's a, you know, you know, that's that's a pretty impressive card. Okay, those are bragging rights. Okay, but if you take the bragging rights away, um, the rest of Europe, you know, it lowers in productivity as well. And and I can see how um, the Americans see Europe as a prize because then they'll buy our arms, they'll buy our energy. They'll, you know, that, that that that's fine. But it seems to me a hollow victory because then Europe is basically taking itself as a major power off the chessboard. I mean, it, it, it's just a, a backwater where most of the productivity will be in the East and the South. So the Americans won, I guess, but it's kind of like 13 per, uh, place ribbon, isn't it? Well, here's the disparity between what you're saying and what the Americans are saying. You're looking, what's gonna happen after one year? The American time frame is one year. There's a president, a congressional election in uh, November uh, that's the time frame of the United States. They, and there have been articles in the Wall Street Journal saying, yes, all these things are forecast to happen uh, after a few years down the road, global warming, military. The fact is uh, we should always act uh, in the short run because uh, who can forecast the long run? Nobody can. We'll, we'll handle that when we get to it. So they're really looking very short. This is their, their philosophy, and it's explicit. They make it explicit. The, the short run is the long run for them. Well, it sounds like a used car salesman. Sell it now. Who cares if it's broken? Okay, we'll, we'll worry about the, the, the repo later. Okay, I mean, uh, you, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov said to Sputnik and to uh, um, RT, I think in the last news cycle, he explicitly said it's the lack of um, competent leadership in the West is one of the reasons why we've got here. Add to it this ideological dimension. Go ahead, George. Yeah, no, I, I was also wondering now, how do you see uh, Russia and in particular China uh, responding? I mean, because um, you know, obviously the Chinese see this conflict going on in Ukraine. They don't want to see uh, Russia defeated. Um, to what extent are they really going to uh, help Russia out? I mean, is, it, is, it, is this really a, a, a very firm, Kind of friendship, you know, really that they are going to go all out to help Russia uh, prevail, or are they going to basically, you know, keep 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 their powder dry? What what do you think? I don't see Russia being defeated. I think uh, what it's going to do is develop is, uh, more and more of its uh, industries uh, at home to be uh, independent. Uh, the feeling I get reading uh, President Putin's and uh, uh, Lavrov's 
uh, reports is they're just disgusted with Western Europe. They're di they just, uh, uh, there's no way you can deal with them. And uh, many Americans uh, share that disgust. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's not going to be a question of defeat. Uh, what Russia, has, uh, the original plan of uh, Russia was that you would make money by exporting more gas and oil to Europe. But what they found instead was uh, that if uh, uh, Russia cuts back the gas to Europe, it'll make even more money. That it can make money by not exporting gas to Europe because the, the price is going to soar for, uh, for, for Germans. They've, uh, uh, they've already uh, rationed uh, their uh, gasoline on, uh, on, on their uh, uh, gas uh, and uh, oil uh, usage on uh, uh, Wednesday. Uh, so that the, the Germans are not expecting uh, the uh, gas and oil to come back online. I have no idea where the, uh, the dynamos to um, power the, uh, uh, the gas is. Uh, uh, Canada is still, uh, uh, it has a very large uh, Galician population there uh, that is uh, opposing uh, returning the, uh, the, the gas to Russia. I think uh, here's a, if, if I were, uh, uh, Secretary Lavrov, here's what I would suggest to, uh, to Germany and Siemens. I said, well, Siemens, you know, we know you want our gas, you want your oil. Uh, of course, if we give you the gas and oil, we have to get something for it. Uh, we, we don't want uh, uh, euros, we don't want dollars. What we would like is for you to uh, set up a, a dynamo uh, fixing uh, uh, company here so that we can fix our own uh, gas uh, 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 dynamos uh, when, when we need. Uh, we want technology. We'll, we'll provide you with all the gas and oil you need, but uh, in exchange, we want an equivalent value of, of high technology so that we can, just like uh, China has asked for technology transfer, uh, the new form of trade is going to be Russian raw materials for technology transfer. So Russia will not be dependent on the West. That would be my idea of uh, a good trade. <laughs> But that's recognizing a parity. That's recognizing equality. And that it and built into that is mutual respect. All three don't exist. And I don't see it coming back anytime soon. Okay. Because we do know that okay, the European sanctions are different than the American sanctions, but the European sanctions will follow the American sanctions. And I asked both of you, and it's not a rhetorical question, how often do the Americans um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, end sanctions against the country? Almost never. Uh, yeah, and that's, and that's kind of what I was wondering. I mean, how, how, you know, what, how does this now develop? Because as things stand, we're heading towards uh, winter. Winter's gonna be here in just a few months. Uh, there's serious issues about energy. The Europeans, they're committed to cutting back on oil, oil, oil imports by the end of the year. Uh, we don't know whether the Russians are going to um, open up the valves uh, for uh, Nord Stream 1. Um, what happens now? I mean, what, I mean, are we really just heading towards uh, an apocalypse? What, what do we do? Well, the question is, uh, to what extent are uh, Europeans uh, willing to accept the decline in living standards, yeah. corporate bankruptcy, and lower wages uh, simply to follow uh, something that benefits America? America is getting rich off the sanctions. American oil companies uh, are getting rich as they control the world oil trade outside of Russia, and they have a bonanza in uh, uh, higher uh, oil and gas prices, just like uh, uh, Russia is having a, a, a bonanza. Uh, the American farm exporters are going to have a bonanza. And most of all, uh, Europe has uh, completely disarmed itself by sending almost all of its arms to Ukraine and uh, the military industrial complex in America is saying, don't buy French arms, don't buy German arms, buy American arms. Uh, you, uh, and uh, so in, instead of Europe rebuilding its economy by domestic spending, it's supposed to rebuild its armed forces by sending its money out of the country uh, to the United States. It's uh, very much in the same condition of Argentina or Paraguay. Well, it also um, uh, talk about the issue of debt, because that's something that is one of your favorite topics here, because I think this is one of the most paralyzing things. If you look at Russia's external debt, it's virtually non-existent, okay? 
Um, and, and that is one of its biggest uh, pluses in, in dealing with the new structures that we've already mentioned here. Um, but you know what, what um, uh, the Germans are, are dragging their feet, obviously, because they're the ones going to have to pay the most. Is this this Marshall Plan for for Ukraine, which you know they, everybody you know is, pats each other on the back. Yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And then they, they, they I think, what is it? Um, uh, uh, I don't know what the number. I've forgotten what it is. It's a huge number, much more than the Marshall Plan uh, in 20, 22 dollars. But um, the only way they could do it is to go into debt, and they're in very high debt situations already. That is completely untenable. What Germany's uh, payments on debts now are, is getting quite serious on a yearly basis. Well, two things about what you said uh, regarding the Marsh, uh, the uh, uh, forty billion dollars that uh, the United States has promised to Ukraine. Already committed, right. Uh, all that 40 billion is going to leave the United States. All that 40 billion is going to be spent within the United States for arms to be sent to Ukraine, made by American capital and American labor, and uh, American uh, uh, government uh, uh, planning. It's all going to be spent here and sent the result of the spending over there. So there's no, no uh, balance of payments problem here. For Germany and Europe, the problem's quite different. Uh, America can, can print all the money at once uh, by the Federal Reserve, uh, but uh, the, Euro has, uh, the Eurozone has tied its hands in a straitjacket monetarily. It cannot run a budget deficit for any country of more than 3% of its uh, GDP. And yet, uh, all of a sudden, Europe has said it, it need, it's going to spend at least 2% of its GDP on NATO. And to catch up, this is going to be another 2%. This means all year, uh, at the same time that Europe is going into a depression with companies going bankrupt because they've issued bonds uh, and they borrowed money, uh, expecting to uh, pay the bonds by uh, producing fertilizer, uh, producing uh, machinery with gas and oil, and now they can't produce uh, the goods to earn the income to pay the bondholders and the banks, and indeed that means they're, they're going to be defaults. Uh, in America, the United States would simply uh, uh, create the money to uh, uh, pay to the country companies going under as long as they were um, uh, Democrats or Republicans, and uh, China would simply create uh, uh, the credit. But Europe does, uh, for Europe to create uh, the credit, it would have to change all the rules of the Eurozone uh, so that one of the by, uh, the uh, casualties in all of this may be the Eurozone and its right-wing crazy monetary straitjacket uh, that it says, uh, uh, are you really willing to impose a depression on yourself just to buy arms to go to war with Russia when if there is a war, you're going to be in the middle? Yeah. Do, I mean, is that sustainable? I mean, can the European Union survive uh, under these circumstances? Well, wouldn't you know, sensible countries say, we're out of here? I mean, this, this makes no sense for us. I mean, uh, Hungary is an obvious candidate to say, we, we don't want any more of this, but there'd be others. I mean, Greece uh, and, and so on. I mean, what, what, what's, what's the value added on staying in, NATO, in the European Union? Well, somehow uh, the, uh, a losing situation always goes on much longer uh, than you would anticipate. You can draw uh, lines and there will be a point of intersection and you'll say, okay, the crisis has to come here. The comp companies go under, how long can people take it? And yet they do take it. It's uh, like a, uh, a frog boiling in water very slowly. Somehow uh, there's an enormous elasticity of the willingness to suffer when they think that there is a, a reason to suffer. Well, in Ukraine, they have it because there's a race hatred. Uh, there's a Nazi feeling we have to kill the Russians. Uh, in America, they're willing to suffer because they say we hate the Russians and, and the Chinese. That's almost like a race hatred uh, there. Uh, does Europe have uh, the same race hatred? Uh, are, to what extent are they going to uh, relate their uh, suffering to uh, the fact that uh, all of this is unnecessary and all of this is a product of choice. That uh, It's like they're, uh, they're not being killed, they're committing suicide. Uh, do they really want to do that? How do, you, how do you raise their consciousness? That's the problem. Well, I mean, the, the, okay, the, I, I, I agree with that, but the, the, we're entering the realm, something that the Europe hasn't experienced since, uh, at least as a, a continent, since the Second World War. 
when, when bread is really expense, expensive, there are shortages, petrol is really expensive. You can't afford to drive your car to work to earn money. I mean, this is a new dimension that Europe is going to have to face. And while it doesn't specifically apply to Boris Johnson, I would say, you know, the, the, I think you've, you, you know, you've heard the Assad, the uh, Assad curse, you know, how many leaders have uh, fallen uh, being involved in the Syrian proxy civil war. Now there's going to be the Ukraine curse, okay? Draghi, uh, Boris Johnson, we have governments in the Baltic states, I think, uh, George, correct me if I'm wrong, in uh, Bulgaria or yeah, Romania. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, Macron himself um, <laughs> badly lost his um, uh, parliamentary majority. So, um, and uh, you know, the, the, the Tories, I mean, they're heading for annihilation at the, whenever the next election will take place, you know, maybe next year. Um, they're going to be annihilated, even though Labour's no better, of course, on the issue of Ukraine. But it's clear that uh, governments are extremely um, unpopular. So um, it, it's the, the, the agenda that they've spelled out, these European leaders, well, we have to do this for Ukraine because of the rules-based order or because of, uh, you know, we mustn't um, allow Putin to win. We can't allow aggression to prevail in international law. None of that is resonating with the public because they don't understand what any of that has got to do with them. Um, I think, which is why I think that there is a, there's a, a political instability along the way because, you know, they're, they're making all these sacrifices for what? You know, what's Ukraine to us? Well, here's the problem. It's not simply the leaders. Of course, the leaders are going to be blamed. Somebody has to be blamed. The problem is the political parties. There is no political party uh, that is really an anti-war party, except for the right-wing nationalist parties uh, that have a right-wing nationalist domestic uh, economic policy. So uh, with there, without a vehicle to express this popular discontent and to express the uh, outlines of what an alternative would be, here's what uh, Europe and Russia could be, but you're going to have to do something that the American uh, neocons don't like. Uh, there's no party saying that. Uh, because the United States has spent an enormous amount of uh, money, billions of dollars, uh, five billion in Ukraine alone, just by the National Endowment for Democracy, meaning uh, Endowment for Autocracy, uh, basically, to um, meddle in the politics of these countries and to give financial support to candidates within every party and leadership that follow uh, U.S. Uh, directions, uh, money and bribery and uh, subsidy and campaign contributions uh, really have sort of uh, uh, shriveled up uh, European politics. How are you going to have a political party making the points that uh, the three of us are talking about uh, today? Uh, and especially now that uh, Europe and America have shut down uh, RT and uh, most of the Russian uh, uh, vehicles for uh, discussing uh, that the, the uh, population is in the dark with no uh, visible political leaders or mass media or major newspapers. Uh, but what, 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 yeah, but what about um, Viktor Orban? I mean, Orban is, yes, he's generally following the NATO line, but nonetheless, his point is, hey, it's nothing to do with us. We're not going to get involved. Um, you know, no, no transfer of weapons through um, Hungarian territory. I mean, that's about the most that you yeah. can hope for uh, from anyone. I mean, do you think that's likely to be a message taken up by uh, others? Uh, Europe is talking about expelling uh, uh, Hungary from the uh, European yes. Union or making it leave by saying uh, they're passing a rule of the, uh, in view of the oil and gas crisis. Any country that gets some oil and gas, like uh, uh, Hungary, has to share it proportionally with all the other EU countries. So Hungary would only get to use 10% of the gas that it, and oil that it gets uh, from Russia. This is this would absolutely uh, uh, speed the parting guess. Uh, <laughs> Just absurd. I mean, this is like, this is like socializing foreign policy. I and mean, and they're is, leaning on Hungary. I mean, they're leaning on the foreign. I mean, the Hungarian foreign is just plummeting. I mean, okay. you know, there's no question. This, this, this is EU pressure against um, Orban uh, for, for not following the line. So I mean, that's why, you know, Hungarian economy is not doing well. This well, one's meaning to the word free market. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, Michael, I mean, one of the things, you know, I, I've been living in Russia for um, a quarter century right now, and, um, and particularly since uh, Putin's 2007 uh, Munich Security Conference speech, you know, I, there's a very strong um, um, lineage that you can uh, uh, focus on. And, you know, and there's a, is, and there's a Russian word, and I, I really like it. It is um, agreement incapable, okay? It's an amazing word, agreement incapable. Um, I love saying it in English, actually, because it sounds cool. But, you know, we've been talking about the intricacies and the, and the failings of uh, um, the Euro um, project. The Euro is a currency. Neoliberalism is an ideology. All are dead ends, the way I look at it. And that's why, you know, why should you deal with people that are agreement incapable? And I think, you know, you've already kind of touched upon it here. There's just this, you know, let these people do what they're going to do. Just make sure they're not dangerous, okay? We got to get out of their toxic financial system. Their, their whole cultural vector is just completely beyond 99.9% .9 of the global South and the East. I have no idea what these crazy people in the West are talking about with all their crazy media and the ridiculous social media stuff. We're, we're pumping kids with all of this junk and you know what I'm getting at here. The, 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 the thing is, is that no, let them um, 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 stew in their own juices. We've got other things to do. And I think that's really what's going on right now. They, you know, it's not that, you know, um, uh, Russia, it's not that Russia is going to appease anymore. It's done with that. And a very specific one, and we, and there's so many, but the, uh, the most specific one um, um, at, this, at this point in time is that the Minsk agreements, one and two, they would never commit to them. So whatever, why would anyone in the Kremlin want to sit down and make a deal with these people? You didn't do it then, why would you do it in the future? Okay, so I, I, that's this breach that we're talking about. It, it's not, you know, we're not disagreeing on the, on the margins. This is a breakdown. Yes, the, uh, the word that translated uh, from uh, President Putin's speeches in the United States is non-agreement capable. <laughs> More literal, uh, but that, that's the, the word that is, is even in the New York Times now, uh, that word. And uh, uh, I think there's, uh, people have pointed out that it's not simply that uh, uh, Macron and Europe and Germany did not try to enforce the, uh, uh, the uh, agreements, the, the min, min agreements that you mentioned. It's that well, the Europeans said, we never intended to from the beginning. And that Zelensky said, we never intended to, we were playing for time. And, that, was, uh, that was Poroshenko. That was Poroshenko, right? Yeah, yeah. We're playing for time. You're Poroshenko, right? Uh, and uh, so that you're you're realizing that you know this is how I think the Romans did uh, uh, foreign policy, and we know what happened to the Roman Empire. Uh, <laughs> you you cannot make uh, an agreement because there's an absolute uh, there is the kind of people that go into national security uh, work. Uh, they're like policemen, they're bullies and cowards. Uh, they really are afraid that there will be a new Holocaust. Uh, uh, and uh, they're, they, they feel that you have to hit first before uh, they hit you yet again. They're obsessed with past losses. They're the losses of their ancestors. They're obsessed with uh, past hurts. Uh, and uh, they're not looking, they're not, you're looking forward and saying, what's the future? They're looking uh, at the past and say, how do we uh, avenge ourselves uh, for uh, other countries? Uh, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, they live in this world where it's uh, perpetually Munich, 1938, you know, yeah. Hitler has just come to Hitler, power. And, and, we're and, always uh, waiting for the next Hitler, the next yeah, exactly. Hitler. Exactly, so you know, we're talking about events, you know, which will soon be, you know, 100 years ago. Um, I've, I've worked with our national security people for 60 years. Hitler is what they keep talking about. And, that, uh, and Hillary picked it up. Uh, and largely, these are the uh, uh, the Zionist uh, neocons. They're obsessed with the Holocaust, and they really think that if uh, they can't control other countries, other countries can do something to them. It's a it's a such a hostile worldview that uh, very few people have it. But uh, uh, the people that go into national security and diplomacy are self-selecting, uh, and. Uh, you, you, you mentioned something earlier that, that I think is really quite fascinating. George and I have um, thought a great deal 
um, about what NATO means. NATO is not a military alliance. It is turning into a substitution for the United Nations. However, you've pointed out, and I think correctly so, is that we see the same process with Russia, China, possibly possibly India, other countries that, you know, they see that the United Nations is, and it's, oh, Russia is always blamed for the veto, but it's the West veto all of the time more than anything else. And so I see, again, this kind of uh, parallel worlds coming into existence because um, NATO is a substitute for the United Nations and there is no security council in, the United, in, in NATO. It's, there's one country that calls the shots and it has its, its little pet, the UK, which is quite interesting is that's the, a, a new way for the UK to get involved in European politics uh, post Brexit is the back door of NATO, okay? And so I think, again, you know, agreement incapable is that the Russians and the Chinese and other people that have, um, uh, that see the problems with Western institutions are gonna say, it's, gonna, it's probably better to go with these guys, okay? I mean, because they, 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 they're a lot more transparent and there's not one bully sitting at the head of the table. Thoughts? But that requires them to set up a design a whole new set of institutions. And I'm sure what uh, that's what they're talking about now. Uh, how do you set up a, a World Bank and a world, uh, uh, the, a, a BRICS bank that will, uh, countries will use their own currencies uh, for swap and the BRIC ba BRICS bank can uh, fund that trade, but it doesn't want to fund uh, Latin America's definite payment to American bondholders. Uh, it wants tr mutual trade. How are you, uh, when you have these two worlds with two separate systems, they almost have to be sealed separate. You can't have a leakage from one to another. That's going to be the real problem. Where are countries like Turkey going to fit in? Where is Pakistan going to fit in? Uh, you're talking about creating a whole new international system. And uh, uh, not everybody thinks of uh, international systems. You think of the results. How does a market work within a system? Whereas what we need to think about is how do you create a new system within which the market forces will work? Yeah, but I guess you, you were also saying that you thought that you'd have to create a new United Nations, which is not um, not wholly um, implausible because, I mean, it's, it's hard to kick Russia out of the um, uh, United Nations Security Council, uh, but there may come a point in which Russia would just simply get fed up and say, uh, we're tired of uh, constantly being uh, uh, you know, set upon. Um, Russia needs to remain in the United Nations with its veto. Remember I, how- I, I agree, I, yeah, no, I, I absolutely oh, agree. Oh, uh, up and until, up and until. Exactly, but nonetheless, there's no, there's no question that the, the Americans and the British have been talking for years and years about how do, how do we kick Russia out? Because you know, Russia's always thwarting us. I mean, it's a, whatever we try to do, the Russians are always thwarting us. So you know, they probably can't do it, but nonetheless, you know, the, the, they are, they are going, they're going to try and kick Russia out. Well, Russia's uh, and China's uh, and Iran's response to keep America out will be to create ever, a whole United Nations without the United States, Israel, and the uh, uh, Pacific Island territories that always vote. <laughs> Those specific territories, that's the only time they, they, make, they make the difference, huh? Okay, where we ever hear about them. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, well, well, Michael, as far as the, um, the, the, you were on Crosstalk yesterday, and tell us a little bit about what you think this upcoming recession, at least in the, in the, in the West, is going to look like, okay? Because we, we, we talk in abstractions a lot, how is it going to be for average people? Because this is, you know, George and I have uh, often talked about how foreign policy adventures in the Middle East, you know, you might come across it on the nightly news or in your car, you hear about, oh, this distant place called Iraq, uh, can't find it on a map, but it doesn't affect the price of oil in your, in your uh, gas in your tank. It doesn't really affect the, 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 the cost of bread. We are now in a situation where it, this is very, very meaningful. The only, the, the, the way the vast majority of people understand what's the, that there's something going in Ukraine going on in Ukraine is because something everything else around me is getting more expensive. This is very different than what we've seen in the past. Well most of the great fortunes in the world for the last uh, thousand years have been made in recessions in bad times. So the question is uh, in order to say what's going to happen to the people in the recession, say how are the wealthiest families going to clean up and make a real fortune 
off the coming recession. Uh, you're already seeing in the United States, a uh, home ownership is falling very rapidly. Uh, uh, you're going to find people not being able to uh, afford to take out mortgages to buy new homes. So you're going to have the uh, uh, private capital companies buying up homes and turning uh, them into uh, rent rental uh, operations. So uh, you'll have America and Europe becoming a country of renters, not homeowners. You're going to have uh, the middle class uh, really uh, finally coming to realize that there isn't any such thing as the middle class. They're all wage earners. It's, uh, interesting, it's interesting, the middle class that we so much prize for political stability and prosperity, uh, and they're ba basically being transformed into what we used to call the working class of the 19th century. Yes, there's a lot of uh, uh, resist psychological resistance to that. Uh, at at uh, New York University the other day, the, the professors were having a, an argument over pay with uh, uh, the administration. And one professor said, they're treating us like we're, <laughs> we're workers. And a uh, well, political science professor who happened to be a Marxist said, well, that's what we are. We're working for, uh, for, for money. And uh, everybody, it's sort of like, oh my God, the shame of it all. <laughs> right. You know, but, uh, yeah. But, but it, you, you also spoke, which was very interestingly, um, in, in other, other places about when uh, what the West has done by seizing uh, Russia's um, foreign mm. uh, yeah. currency reserves and by essentially, you know, the West and countries, but the UK, the US, just seizing the private property of uh, Russians, you know, whose only crime is that they happen to be Russians, so automatically they assume to be close to Putin. So basically, that the, the West has essentially sawn off its own foot because now, why would anyone want to keep uh, his uh, foreign currency reserves in the, uh, the Western banks? Why would anyone want to buy property in Lake Como or in uh, London if they think that, uh, you know, at any moment the government can just seize it? and without any providing any kind of legal redress. Well, this is what's so ironic. Uh, for the last five years, I've been reading speeches by President Putin and President Xi of China, uh, and they've talked about de-dollarization and the need for multipolarity. And uh, I expected the logical thing was that they would take the lead in this, but it was going very slowly. It's the United States that is uh, forcing them to uh, act in their own self-interest. It's the United States that's forcing them to take the quantum leap to, okay, we really got to create a full-blown alternative set of institutions uh, to go it alone with each other. And after all, we're Eurasia, the whole Eurasian continent. We, we can be completely self-sufficient. We don't need North the, uh, the Western hemisphere. Uh, we can uh, do it all by, all by ourselves. And that seems to be, uh, uh, finally, they're, they're realizing that. And I hope that they're uh, uh, working on it. Yeah. Why, do you know why did Russia leave, what is it, 300 billion um, in foreign currency reserves and foreign banks? Do you know why that was? Well, it needed them to, uh, basically for, uh, to stabilize the exchange rate. Uh, companies uh, kept their uh, uh, governments and central banks kept uh, uh, dollars and sterling in London so that if there was a uh, every day their trade payments and uh, you use uh, these reserves to... Uh, uh, to stabilize the currency, uh, and uh, in case you want to use them to buy, uh, trans translate your reserves into buying actual companies, like the Americans use dollars to buy up uh, European industry and or Russian industry as it, and uh, raw materials, as it might be. So uh, now that they realize that the West isn't going to let uh, uh, Russia, China, uh, Iran buy any domestic uh, companies uh, or can grab it, uh, uh, they'll simply keep their money uh, at home uh, and uh, compensate by t uh, taking an equivalent amount of Western investment in Russia. Uh, I think Russia's come out ahead uh, uh, of all of this and China's come out ahead. And uh, most of all, the United States will never be able to somehow finance its foreign military spending by pumping dollars into the uh, world and just expecting, oh, the central banks will just uh, save them up and they'll never cash them in. Now everybody's cashing them in. And uh, how will the United, ultimately, this is not going to be good news for the US dollar. It's good news now because all the money from Europe and uh, the, uh, uh, Latin America is flowing into the dollar. But now uh, that without uh, Eurasian money, 
uh, in the dollar without the new uh, alternative uh, uh, world order, order uh, the West will go it alone. And how can it go alone without manufacturing, uh, resource dependent, having to import its raw materials? It can't go, go it alone. And so uh, at a certain point, the United States will look like Germany's looking right now. You know, one of the big stories um, that, uh, since the uh, special military operation um, in Ukraine, and I, I, I got blindsided by it um, and am fascinated. Talk about what's going on with the ruble, because it is the best performing currency this year. How did that happen? Well, if uh, R Russia realizes uh, it can't take payment in dollars or euros because all its bank deposits have been grabbed, uh, just like Iran's bank deposits were grabbed uh, uh, and uh, uh, Venezuela's gold was grabbed, then uh, it, it will only sell uh, oil and gas and other exports for rubles. So uh, the uh, European companies that uh, buy uh, helium or gas have to uh, go into the foreign exchange market and buy rubles. So uh, this is supporting the price of the ruble. But what Russia doesn't, doesn't really need rubles itself because uh, it can simply create its own rubles. What Russia really needs is uh, technology and things that uh, it would like to import uh, uh, to become independent. So the question is, for the time being, uh, uh, the central bank is quite happy to see uh, Europeans simply buying rubles uh, with, uh, for gas because that, that prevents the ruble from going down. It uh, prevents the uh, Russians from having to pay more in rubles to buy foreign uh, imports from uh, other countries, China, Japan, India. Uh, but at a certain point, uh, Russia doesn't need more rubles because it can produce them itself. It needs what it can't produce itself. It needs something that it doesn't have, not something that it already can have to infinity. So the, the other day, um, Josep Borrell was saying, and we had a, a show, the gaggle about, he said, well, the sanctions are going to work. Uh, they may not be working now, but they will work eventually because Russia needs high-tech products. It won't be able to purchase high-tech products uh, in the world markets, so it's sanctioned um, so on. And then Russia will suffer as a result. And then Putin the other day did seem to say that that is going to be a problem, the high-tech products. Now, can Russia address that problem, the, the high-tech stuff? Sure it can. It can tell uh, 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 Germany and Siemens, say, uh, well, what are you going to give us for our gas? Will, will you please build, help us build a factory to fix our own uh, dynamos? Uh, is it politically viable right now? Maybe in, in, over a certain course of time, certainly not in this moment that we're in. I mean, I agree with you. It makes perfectly logical sense. But then logic is not dictating Western policy. Well, you're right. Uh, all it can do is uh, rely on countries that are not, uh, do not follow the sanctions. I guess that means China, India, uh, uh, the, the country that it's already, already working with. Uh, and what that means is the West will permanently lose these markets that it now has. Uh, the West will lose its technology market. And technology is the great supplier of monopoly rent, of, of, of way super profits. Uh, for having a patent rights and monopoly rights, uh, the, the West will lose all of this. Uh, and uh, it will be, uh, you really can't keep any technology secret. Uh, uh, you couldn't, even in the 12th century, you couldn't keep uh, making uh, uh, the fat silk uh, secret. They finally, Italy got silk from China. Uh, everything you went, uh, ends up uh, global in scale. And uh, that's going to happen and all Russia can do is say, well, we're going to have to do without certain key things, just like uh, the West is having to do without certain key things. We're all becoming independent and self-reliant. And uh, this was uh, the suffering we're doing now is the cost of not being self-reliant uh, from before, believing that free trade would create a global world and that this could be done under US leadership and that the United States would say, uh, it's all gonna trickle down and our wealth will be your wealth. And uh, uh, we found out we had a, we're following a wrong junk economic well, idea. Isn't it really interesting? Not too long ago, you know, you would hear these, uh, you know, the Davos folks, you know, interdependence is inevitable. We can't decouple, you know, all, you know, all this, you know, um, um, 
their interpretation of, of free trade, which obviously is not, okay. Um, but, you know, this whole um, discourse about um, globalization, which they worship, is, is being shown to be completely hollow. It, it, it's breaking down right now. And there's, and there's every reason to believe talking to you um, is that there's a good, cent, a good percentage that it's going to succeed if you have the political will for it. Because the, the whole idea of having sovereign control of your country and of your economy is something that is just evaporated in the West. What is sovereignty? What do we need? We don't need borders. We don't need any of these things. But it's the, the, the East and the Global South. It's more important now than ever before. Well, when you said uh, that they're saying uh, it, uh, it, it, interdependence is inevitable, what they really said is your dependence on us is inevitable. Yeah. It's a one-sided dependency. Yeah. It's not a mutual interdependency. There's no mutuality there. It's one-sided. And uh, you have to look at the, you follow the money. You have to look at uh, who's, who's getting the benefit. So how, how do you see it, Michael, the the near term i mean what was going to happen during the next 12 months are we going to have famine uh we're we going to have um, mass uh freezing uh in uh, in europe um what's going to happen because it's, everything just seems to be we're all heading to uh, over the cliff the famine would occur in the global south in latin america and uh, africa uh you'll have uh monetary famine in europe you'll have bankruptcy uh mm -hmm. but i be, uh, they're, they're going to be able to feed themselves somehow. Uh, Russia and uh, I know Germany uh, still has uh, uh, their own gardens. Uh, in America, they don't have gardens here. Uh, I live in Forest Hills in New York City. And you're not allowed uh, to have anything but uh, grass on your lawn. You're not allowed to have gardens in public view, that that will lower the property prices they claim. The land of the free and the brave. Well, great. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, Michael, you, you say this, and I'm in complete agreement. And, you know, I don't think any of us have any secret knowledge or a, 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 a secret wand. I mean, this is all staring us in the face. Is there anything being done to avert it? The only version you can do is what uh, Russia, China, Iran, and India are doing, saying, uh, let's create an alternative as quick as we can. Mm -hmm. it, you, it, it's not a problem. It's a quandary. Uh, it can't be solved in the, within the uh, uh, American leadership, uh, your dependence on us. Uh, it has to, it, 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 we've reached a quantum leap where there's, there's a separation. It's like uh, uh, a family is deciding we can't live in this town. Uh, in the American Westerns, it would be, this town ain't big enough for both of them. <laughs> is, that, is that really feasible? Can, can Chinese, yeah. Russians, um, you know, get together and create this alternative financial system and all the, the alternative IMF, alternative World Bank, all the rest? Is that, can, is that doable, at least in the near future? Well, if, if I were there, I could do it. Okay. Yes, it's doable. I can think in my mind how to do it. Yes. Of course it's doable. It was done before by the Americans. Why can't it be done by the Russians and Chinese? Of course it's doable. But, 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 it's it something that we've, we've already covered a little bit here. It, it's certainly feasible. There's a will, there's a way, and it, it's not as if they don't have the capital and the know-how to do it. Obviously they do. But would that trigger a major military conflict. The Americans won't sit back and watch that happen. They have their they have their um, uh, pit bull NATO. Okay, I mean uh, th this is something that I always worry about because the, the the U.S. will be preemptive. They will say no, we won't let you uh, uh, let you do this. Okay, um, and and we see you know all around the world you know the. Um, uh, cr creating tensions in the Caucasus, for example, or okay? get the get the Turks and the Armenians get at it, get, you know, uh, uh, get the Azerbaijan heated up again, and always there's Iran and all the. I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of nasty stuff they can do, and they do do it. Okay, so I, I don't see I don't see um, uh, Jake Sullivan, you know, saying no, 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 we're not going to let you do that. Okay, and, and they're doing the provocation all the time. I mean, there's Pelosi yeah. going to Taiwan. I mean. I mean, why? Why is she going to Taiwan? I mean, it's 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 they're just going out of their way to yep. antagonize and to provoke. 
Well, I, I, the questions you're asking, uh, I've just written a book that answers all of those uh -huh. questions. Uh, the Destiny of Civilization. That's a, and I say exactly how to create these institutions by explaining what uh, the United States and, uh, uh, and uh, England did uh, to confront Europe with at the end of uh, uh, World War II. If you can, I can send you a link to put up to, for the cover okay. to put on. The destiny uh, of civilizations. That's the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll post that, um, uh, you know, the link, you know, um, uh, you know, to the interview and everything. So anyway, Michael, I mean, this was a really fascinating discussion. Thank you so Fun. much for uh, taking the time uh, to be, uh, to join us. Um, you know, it was, I, I learned a great deal. So. Thank you, know, thank you so you much. Do. Hope we can do this um, again very soon. Uh, I hope so. If you can send me a link, I will put it up on many American sites. If you can send me a link to it or even a transcription. Okay, so we'll do that. Yeah. Link? Yeah. Uh, thank you, right. Michael. Thank you. I love and you. remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>